technical difficulties, just type it in the chat and we're here to help you, okay? All right, so thanks for being with us today. We wanna to give a special thank you to our sponsors. We believe that information on our rare disorder should be free and available to anyone who is interested. And without the generous support of Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Greenwich Biosciences, and Neuron Pharmaceuticals, um, we wouldn't be able to provide all of this wonderful education to you. And that um, allows us to direct more of our fundraising dollars from families, from our strollathons and all the other wonderful galas and um, events that you all hold towards research. So thank you to our sponsors. Our agenda today, um, we're gonna start with our welcome and introductions. Then we're gonna hear from our team at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Rec Clinic about um, current offerings. So a town hall, what is a town hall? It's an opportunity to give a current state of affairs um, and allow you to ask questions of your rec clinic team and of retsyndrome.org that are on your mind. Then um, after the clinic team gives some presentations to you, I'll give some updates from retsyndrome.org and then we'll go into a good half hour of QA. So. Again, sit back, relax, we're recording all of this information. You know, as we find ourselves at the crossroads of many global health, societal, political, and environmental issues competing for our attention and resources, um, we just, we felt it was time to recenter and refocus our attention on this road uh, called Rett Syndrome, because it's a very personal road to us, and we were cast upon it with our children, not because of anything we did or didn't do, but um, it's a difficult road nonetheless, and it's very lonely indeed if we don't travel um, with others. And it's with traveling with others through our clinic, through retsyndrome.org, through other families that we find help and hope. So Rett syndrome has no boundaries. It affects one in approximately 10,000 worldwide. Most have never heard of it and no parent wishes for it. However, the bright and engaging eyes and smiles of our mostly nonverbal children do envelop our hearts and minds with purpose and move us to find strength where we never thought possible. I wanna share a quote from a family who wrote to us about two years into their diagnosis. Um, I'm, I think you probably have read it already, but let me, let me read it out loud in case you don't have visuals and you're just dialing in um, with, audit, with the audio today. Today marks two years since we found out A has RET. Before she was diagnosed, I worried about why she can't do this. When we got the diagnosis, it was she won't be able to do this. And now I try to focus on figuring out how she can do this. I'm so proud of her, all that she has and continues to accomplish. While I still have moments of sadness and worry about what the future will bring, I'm trying to ground myself in the present because it's a good place to be. I think this quote really, really reflects almost universally our parent and caregiver experience of coming to this world called Rett syndrome. Although the timeline might be different for each and every one of us, um, we hope that that final conclusion of after knowing that our child had skills that they stopped doing, we went through the journey of trying to find the diagnosis, we got the diagnosis, that by meeting retsyndrome.org, by getting connected with your clinic at Cincinnati Children's, that we can help you get more rapidly and more quickly to that good space of how can she do this? And with all of the tools and the resources that we have, that you will be able to live better with Rett syndrome in your family today than without having these connections. We hope that this town hall will make you aware of a lot of resources that maybe you didn't know were out there for you. And um, at, one, at some point in time, we hope that you will join in our community of mentoring and helping other families because it's through all of these connections that we can really focus on what she can do or he can do rather than being stuck in that very difficult, anxious place of what they have lost. So we hope that uh, through these connections that you will have a life with more success and less stress, that we will go from grief to growth together. So with all of that being said, um, 
I would like to say that it is our definite pleasure to partner with your team at Cincinnati Children's. For many years now, uh, it has been our uh, joy to partner with them for referrals, knowledgeable and compassionate clinical care, for the natural history study data collection efforts through clinical trials, and um, various working groups that they work on collectively with a network of clinics across the country to advance our knowledge of Rett syndrome, accelerate research, and accelerate care. Um, we are so disappointed that we were ha had to move all of our meetings virtually this year, but it has also allowed us this opportunity to have unique town halls with each and every clinic, as opposed to having a national meeting or just a few ed days. So we are gonna make the best of the situation before us. And I would like to invite Dr. Shannon Standridge, who is the director of the RET Clinic, um, the RET Center and Related Spectrum Disorders Clinic, to turn on her webcam and introduce herself Tell us a little bit about her whole team. There you go. Hi, Dr. Standridge. Okay, and I'm going to um, allow you to bring up your slides. I'm gonna stop my webcam. Thank you so much for being with us on this Saturday <laughs> after a week of clinic, after months of trials and tribulations and disruptions. I wanna say, first of all, all of us in the community, Thank you, your team, and all of the healthcare workers and essential workers at Cincinnati Children's for staying with us. We know you didn't go dark over the summer, but you did have to learn how to practice medicine and conduct research in ways you probably never imagined having to do. So nope. please take some time, update us on where you're at, and uh, tell us about all the wonderful things that are going on in Cincinnati. Thank you so much, Paige, and thank you to RettSyndrome.org uh, for asking us to talk with each and every family that's on today and those that might tune in later. I want to thank you for you spending your time with us, too. For those of you who have seen and um, met our team, for those of you who haven't, I extend the invitation and really, truly want to extend a warm welcome and ask that you come see us yourselves so we can get to know your child and yourself in our clinic. And thank you again for the opportunity to be with you on this wonderful, beautiful day in Ohio, wherever you may be at today. So I wanted to just take a real quick moment and acknowledge that while our uh, clinic name is Rett Syndrome and Related Spectrum Disorders Clinic, that the other development on cephalopathies are such a passion of ours as well. So I want to make sure and note that to, to those families that see us in clinic, to those that in the future will establish with us, to those that are listening today, that really truly um, we aim to give the best care we can to all developmental encephalopathies. Even though I might refer to things today as for Rett syndrome, it really is for all developmental encephalopathies. So please feel welcome at our clinic and by our team. We're passionate to give the care that we can to everyone who comes to see us. Uh, so we're going to move on with further ado. And I just want to pause here and just make sure, Paige, is everything okay from a webcam and audio perspective? I really can't tell here. So if you um, let me know it's all right. Big thumbs up. We can see your great. web, thank you. your audio is great, and we see your slides. Thanks for checking. Okay, great, great, thank you. Okay, so let's move on, gang. And um, as Paige had talked about earlier, we will uh, take questions for sure at the end, and I'm looking forward to that. Okay, um, now I am not able to move my slide down. Let's see, there we go. You wonder, what the heck is she talking about Rett syndrome or is she talking about Alice in Wonderland? It's a little bit of both. If you're like me, you kind of wake up in the morning thinking, oh gosh, what's going to happen today? Is what happened yesterday still hold true today? It's just been a crazy upside down 2020, hasn't it? And it's been like that for everybody around the world. So um, we are not all alone. We are struggling in it together. And I'm just waiting for somebody to pinch me and say, you know, no, Dr. S, it's over. It's all right. Come on out. 
and that's just not happened thus far and I don't expect it to. So I think we're going to continue to live in this Alice in Wonderland type of world for the next several months. And I just want to let you know that you're not alone. We live in it with you guys. And that's why we're talking today because we're looking at and talking about how we can do it better. So here's what we kind of thought about with 2020. This thing hit us fast and hard. And so if you're like me, you spend a lot of time being uncertain or you know scared of the challenges, feeling isolated and having some limitations placed on you. And as Paige had shared with us earlier, those are symptoms or those are feelings that I know many of our families feel a lot of time, regardless of a pandemic. And it just seems like the pandemic has put those feelings on steroids and has made them very, um, very challenging in 2020. And I want to look at words of 2021 because I really believe that our team at Cincinnati Children's really is building on what we've learned from 2020 and really looks forward to using optimism, resilience, perseverance, and working with you and your family to bring the best care to your child in 2021. I really look to making it a rewarding year. And to be honest, I while we're thinking about 2020 and 2021, it's like Buzz Lightyear says, you know, to infinity and beyond. So even though we're talking about more short term and more medium term. Really, our team at Cincinnati Children's is very passionate about bringing the best care we can to all of those with developmental encephalopathies from here forward. It's always been our goal and will continue to be that goal. So how we do it. So here's our wonderful, beautiful campus. Yes, I'm a little bit biased. I understand this. Uh, but this is how it looks right now. But Sherry, who is going to talk to us later, our, our speech therapist, our, our growing campus is really ever growing. And, and so there's going to be more towers in the next aerial picture. So while some of you have experienced our campus, some of you may not have, you know, haven't experienced it as of yet. So I really, again, welcome you to our community and um, look forward to offering that care that we can to you and your family. So this is the aerial view of what you would expect when you would come to kind of see us. And then this is the more clinical picture so both neurology clinics and neurosurgery clinics are, are given this is the house um, where we would excuse me this is where they are housed uh, but truth be told we have a great problem we're growing and so we're looking for space regarding our Rett syndrome and related spectrum disorder clinic so um, you may experience this neurology clinic or you may be in a separate clinic just because of space uh, but that's a wonderful problem to have and we'll make sure that you are aware of that when you would come to visit us so who are you going to see so if you've already been seen by our team many of these faces look familiar to you and wait there's another page we have such a great problem that we have to have a couple pages to feature our team. Um, I am honored to serve with these people on our team. Each one brings their talents, their skills, their knowledge, their expertise, and it is because of our entire team that we can offer really, truly um, wonderful multi-disciplinary uh, team. And we really, truly focus on getting you guys there as few times as possible, particularly with the current constraints of the pandemic. We want to make sure to bring all that care to one place. So you're only parking one time, going down to the lab one time, getting surveillance testing one time. And our team really helps to determine what's needed and how we can address your particular needs and your child's needs at that time. So you can see we have a gynecologist on our team. So yes, we do. And she is full-time on our team and she is there and willing to offer to answer um, all things gyne related and we have all the other members of our team that you see here as well as on this next page so um, again a wonderful uh, team that really is passionate about delivering the best care we can to both your family and your child so um, we were really asked with uh, how are we going to approach the pandemic? How have we been approaching the pandemic? And so this just really quickly outlines kind of the current status quo, although as we all talked about at the beginning with Alice in Wonderland, it might change. I want to make sure first and foremost that 
to make you guys sure, or excuse me, to make sure you're aware that you can just reach out to us. And I'll give you that information at the end of the talk today of how you can reach out to us to find out what's the current approach, what's happening, um, and how can you get scheduled with us. And I would really appreciate you um, having that uh, flexibility to reach out to us because things will change, I'm sure of it. So as of now, our current clinical approach um, is really that it's wonderful. We have more and more clinics to meet your needs. Um, so hopefully as we add an additional half clinics and we now have two full clinic days uh, dedicated developmental encephalopathies throughout every month. We started out with one, we went to one and a half, and now we have two, and we actually even have a epilepsy specific um, clinic for the developmental encephalopathies that we manage, and that happens every few months. So we're really trying to meet the needs without having extended long wait times. Um, we see both new and follow-up patients in most of our clinics, and most occur on the neurology um, division on, in, on that floor in those clinics. However, because of growth, we may sometimes have our clinics in other places in the hospital. The follow-up frequency really varies based on your child's needs. And um, we find most often with our, our kiddos that have the newer diagnoses, um, those that might be more medically complicated, we tend to see those children and adolescents and even young adults a little bit more frequent through those times and then maybe we can back off and then a little bit more frequent through those more acute concerning times uh, but it really does vary on what your family and your child needs um, and so we try to balance that particularly during this time where you don't want to come in as often as possible you really want to avoid that and uh, that's never our goal we always want to make sure that we are judicious regarding how many times we bring you into um, our hospital so we always have that in mind uh, but even more so now <clears throat> so uh, a quick note which i don't have here on the screen oh i guess it's later without limits so i'll touch base on that in a second um, our outreach really obviously we are very accessible to those who are live locally maybe nearby states but we are happy to see anyone. We see patients from Florida, we see patients from Michigan, and we are happy to see patients from any state. If it meets the needs of your family, we are happy to deliver that care to you and your child and look forward to doing so. Uh, so without limits, so we have no upper age limit to our patients that we care for. So from zero to 100, and we look forward to delivering that care to a 100 year old in the, in the near future hopefully right now we see patients up towards their 60s so it's an exciting place to be i never thought <laughs> when we opened up the clinic that we would be doing that and um quickly was brought to my attention through a dear dear parent who called us and asked if we would see her daughter who was 30 and i said absolutely we absolutely can do that and we will do that and ever since that point we've never looked back and we've really developed our care towards um really seen from zero age all the way up to 100. Um, so we care for both genders. We've really expanded that it's not just classic RET that we care for, but the developmental encephalopathies. And so we recognize that a lot of our care is seems to be more female um, kind of catered to, but please, we have been changing that. We've been working on that to make sure we're all inclusive for both females and males because developmental encephalopathy affects both genders. Um, and as I just referenced, the, re the related spectrum disorder. So we really do care for developmental encephalopathies. So knowing that, how can we do it during the pandemic? So um, we, like everyone, and have become better at our approach in accommodating and recognizing that there these are special times. So these goals I've listed are always our goals. They're always front and center to what we want to do and what we try to accomplish. Um, they're just more so now. We're just uh, focusing more on some of these things, such as the safety in, in delivering our care to your child. So one of those is just all the safety practices that we have um, that you would notice coming into the hospital with the masking, with the hand washing, with the distancing, uh, exactly just kind of how we're experiencing life as a whole and the, children, the children's environment just says that 
to the highest um, levels we can. And so you'll notice that as part of trying to keep you and your child safe. Um, and then we carry out the local and the hospital guidelines, just as I referenced. Um, it's really important to us and it's really important to your family, I know this. And so um, we want to make sure to continue on with telehealth opportunity as appropriate so a lot of these decisions aren't my decision, um, unfortunately, but really we have to follow through with what's being decided up above our levels. However, that being said, um, at, at this time and for the foreseeable future, um, until we learn differently, we really wanna meet the needs of you and your family and your child. And we need to balance that with um, the need to see them physically uh, for things such as monitoring their spasticity, monitoring for contractures, monitoring those things um, just monitoring gait as well. And, and um, some of those things are almost impossible to really gauge and follow um, in the most appropriate manner through uh, excuse me, telehealth. So we really try our best to recognize that we have those needs that we need to see um, people for in a physical manner. And we also have surveillance needs, things that we need to be proactive and preventative health care focus. And um, that needs to be in person to get those labs, to get those images. So it's really important that we um, weigh the needs of those things with safety and with the health risks at that current time, excuse me, at that current time that you're coming in to see us. We try to do that. So it's a lot to consider, um, but we very much are cognizant about that as are most clinics, I'm sure of it. And we try to make sure that we can accomplish the best care for your child with what's happening around us at that time. We appreciate your flexibility and we appreciate your patience in that. And just know that again, if there's any questions or concerns, you can reach out to us. We're a small enough community that we can address um, each and every one of your concerns. So um, we look forward to doing that with you and your family. So current research opportunities. So the good news is, is just as we have been and are open to see you guys physically in a clinical sense, so we are also with our research um, opportunities as well. And I just want to note that it has always been our goal to develop, you know, to deliver safe clinical care. And it's always our goal to, to deliver uh, safe research opportunities too. So that has not changed and will never change. We just are looking for ways to do it better. And especially during these times that demand us to think outside the box in some ways. Um, so I wanted to say thank you so much for retcentrum.org to develop the Pathfinder for the research tool that they have because that's a really sharp tool for our families out there nowadays to really find out what's available, if their child might be a subject for that type of study, where it is occurring, what are some of the details that would be helpful to know about up front to learn about the study. It's really a slick tool. And I encourage you guys, if you're thinking about it, just to check it out, just to get familiar with what the opportunities might be for your son or daughter. And um, then beyond that, please reach out to us and I will have that contact information on the next slide. So thank you again, RSO, for making that available because that's a really slick tool and a very useful tool for our families. Um, so uh, the studies with active enrollment at Cincinnati Children's, again, always keeping safety in mind, um, are the Epidiolex drug study for ages two to 18 years of age. And we're currently screening and enrolling in that study. Again, I won't go into each study um, in detail, but I just want to introduce the ones that are currently um, at our hospital. And then we have the Acadia trofinotide uh, drug trials, and that's for ages 5 to 20, and that also we are screening and enrolling in that study as well. Uh, we recently completed the Anavex drug trial, which was in 18 and older uh, subjects, but so I wanted to share good news that that was a recently um, completed um, study, so now we're looking at learning uh, and the data coming out of that study to share with you in the near future. And then our natural history studies, 
So it was expected um, to end in July 2020. And of course, with the pandemic that has changed things, uh, recent, recent approval um, to be extended out through 2021, so July 2021. And now we're currently arranging revised contracts and all the business side of things. So I look forward to um, bringing you guys back into um, CS for the natural history studies and, and getting that really important information that we're learning so much about Rett syndrome and the developmental encephalopathies that we currently are writing about and sharing those papers with the world about what we're learning. So thank you for making it a possibility that we can share and learn about these developmental encephalopathies only because of you guys. So I, I am humbled and look forward to uh, bringing that opportunity back to you guys. Um, these are important contact information. And as Paige said, these um, slides will be posted. So don't feel like you need to rush and write this down now. You should be able to easily get this information. It's also on the RSO uh, research tracker, so you can have it there as well. But um, what might not be on that, and is on our slides here, is Andrea Ganala. She is our Rett Syndrome and Related Spectrum Disorder Administrative Coordinator. And she is the person who, via email, uh, that I would recommend that you would rec uh, that you would reach out to her, excuse me, uh, by email. It's the most, probably the quickest way to reach out to her uh, with any clinic questions, with any clinic concerns, with any insurance questions. And if and there is a time that she can't get that information to you, if she doesn't know it, if and when that hurt that occurs, which I'm not certain it ever does, but if it does, she's gonna get that information. No worries, we will be able to answer those questions for you. Um, and so it may take a little bit of time, especially nowadays, everything takes longer and we appreciate your patience, but we will definitely look towards to um, do anything we can to answer your questions about getting in to see us clinically. Uh, for all things RET, uh, excuse me, RET research related, Epidiolex and Acadia trials, again, you'll see our, our coordinators there. For the natural history trials, our coordinator, uh, Victor LeFay, and his contact information there. So uh, we do have ways to be contacted. We look forward to it and we welcome your questions and your concerns and just um, general discussion regarding possible research or clinical opportunities. So um, this is a picture of our Rett syndrome team from the Rett Strollathon 2019. And regrettably, we did not have it this past year. That is always something that our team looks forward to. We have our hats, we have our shirts, we are out there in full force. And we always look forward to talking with you and your family during that time. And I just wanna say thank you again for um, involving, excuse me, involving us in this talk today. And thank you for inviting us into your home today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry, our speech therapist, our wonderful, talented and experienced speech therapist. Many of you have already met her, and um, I look forward to introducing her to you now. Thanks, Dr. Spanridge. And while Sherry has a chance to bring up her slides, I just want to thank you for such a wonderful um, speed dating with how to uh, be seen at your clinic and the incredible team that you have. And uh, I love that you closed with a picture of your whole team out at the Strollathon because it really shows just how personally connected you are to our community and how much you care um, as, as a physician, but as a human being. Um, I can just say that you, your warmth and connectivity to our community is incredibly valued um, and thank you. So Sherry, if you'd like to go ahead and turn your webcam on, we can see your slides and we are gonna hear uh, about the wonderful communication that you can open up to families who see you at the clinic. So there you go, stage is all yours. Okay, can you hear me? Sure can. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, we'll get started. Um, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for the compliments to Dr. Standridge. That's, uh, that was a hard, um, that'll be a hard presentation to follow, but I will do my best. Um, I have been here at Cincinnati Children's for 20, I think 28 years now, and have enjoyed every moment of it. I started out at the Perlman Center, which is um, an assistive technology um, 
center here at the hospital who sees mostly patients with um, physical disabilities. And um, about two years ago, I, I had the opportunity to join the um, Rett Syndrome Clinic and have loved every minute of it. So um, I'd like to get started and share. This is what we will look like if you come in to see us these days. We have uh, our masks on all the time and our goggles. So like Dr. Standridge was mentioning, we are trying to be as safe as possible uh, when you come in to see us. So lots of mask wearing, lots of hand washing, and lots of social distancing. And this is just part of our team. I'm glad she was able to put up the pictures of everybody. We do have a bigger team, but this is who was available the day that we snapped this sh little shot. So. So I wanted to start, many of you may have already heard the exciting news, and if you haven't, you'll hear it here, but the um, Rett Syndrome Communication Guidelines uh, are now available, and it is to me like a dream come true. It is a handbook for therapists, educators, and families, and it has everything you would ever wanna know about communication. Uh, for patients with Rett syndrome. And it is the most comprehensive um, book I have seen, resource that has been put together. I have recommended it to some of my coworkers who do um, AAC, which is Augmentative and Alternative Communication, um, not just for patients with Rett syndrome, but it is just such an amazing resource. It is helpful to so many. It is a project that was funded by RettSyndrome.org, and that's a, a huge thank you to them because this, like I said, is very valuable, very comprehensive. Um, in my mind, it's a must-have if you um, have a family member with Rett Syndrome or if you have a um, patient that you see if you're a therapist, I do think it's worth having. Um, it was a project that included about 650, I'm sorry, 650 people from 43 countries participated in this uh, project. They reviewed the literature and um, after that they also did surveys. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, there we go. Um, surveys were sent out and 490 caregivers and 120 communication professionals completed the surveys. That is a huge number. That is amazing. Um, there was a panel, a, an expert panel that was put together of 36 professionals and parents who um, formed this panel. They revised and reviewed multiple times all of the um, information that was in the communication guidelines. And once they reached consensus, um, that's the version you have and see today. So you can get on and order that. Um, it's not a very, uh, it's a very minimal cost and I would say it's worth it. Um, it's laid out very nicely. It's easy to read. It has a glossary of terms. Um, in the back, there is a list of resources as far as um, assessments that can be done and also um, augmentative communication, tons of information about access methods and devices. Um, so I would highly recommend it. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to um, use it already. So in the communication guidelines hand, or, um, handbook, they have guiding principles and beliefs, and they are, you'll find those at the beginning of each section of the book. And so I really just wanted to highlight those today and talk just a little bit about um, those, because I do think they are really the most important key factors when we think about communication with um, your kids with Rett syndrome. The first one is communication partners should have an open mind to the communication potential of the individual. I think um, this is really important because I feel like a lot of times you'll hear, you know, they can't do this or they won't do this, um, but I feel like they can communicate and it's just a, a matter of finding the best way to get them to communicate. So always remember to have an open mind and to try to share that with everybody else. Um, you may run into people um, who are a little less open-minded and just remind them that the um, ability is there. We just have to find it. Um, the second guiding principle is that the team should share a common vision. So as you all know, probably being on a variety of different teams, it's only going to progress and go well if your team is working towards the same goal. So it's really important for everybody to speak up, um, talk about what you want the goals to be, and make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page with those goals. So everybody's working and pushing towards those same um, goals. I think that's very important. So this one, um, expect inconsistency. I find that this is very important to talk to other professionals about, maybe who have not spent time or worked with patients who have Rett syndrome. 
expect inconsistency, I think, is one of the um, top things to keep in mind. You may have a few days where um, not alert, not really engaging, and then all of a sudden you're going to have a day and it's going to be amazing. So I feel like within a day, you can have times of the day that are good and times of the day that are bad. And then over the course of a week, you may have a few good days and a few bad days. So it is not necessarily a progression that goes upward. It may be up, down, up, 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 down. So just keep that in mind. Um, but we're always moving to go up. Um, it's just going to look a little different. The other one that I think is incredibly important is make AAC, which is Augmentative and Alternative Communication, available at all times. So um, it's hard, there's a lot going on. I know um, busy families, lots of needs, um, and it's not always easy to grab the picture symbols or the communication board or take time to set up the communication device, but it really is important and does make a difference in I think the overall progress that our kids can make when using AAC. So try to make it as available as possible as much of you as much of the time as you can. Another guiding principle is that assessment should be ongoing and dynamic. So um, each time the kids come through the clinic, we do a, a assessment and try to find out, you know, how things are going, where are things right now, what are some things we should be looking at moving into the future. Um, and our, our kids don't always do standardized testing well. So I know maybe um, in the schools, if the school therapist is trying to conduct what we call a standardized test, that may not be the best way to assess the skills. So doing some more informal types of things would be um, a better way to go. Um, also, no prerequisite skills must be demonstrated before you can provide some type of augmentative or alternative communication. Sometimes people will say, well, you have to show the ability to have cause and effect before you're able to do um, something on a device, or you may need to identify you know, 10 or 20 vocabulary items before you're able to use this type of system. But I really feel like if you just jump in with one of the systems and go with it and just keep trying, I don't necessarily think there are certain skills you have to have before you try. So always, again, it goes back to being open-minded. Another important one is trial periods are essential. Um, basically try before you buy. So I wanted to share a little bit of a story about a young lady that I worked with and um, she came in and she was in her early 20s and I, you know, spent some time, we did some therapy sessions together and boy, her eye gaze was incredible. So I thought, you know, she's going to be able to do this. And so we did some trials on a couple of different eye gaze systems and uh, she would play the games very well and use her eyes. And then when I would pull up some of the communication pages to work on, she would turn her head to the left. And I was sitting on the right, so she wasn't turning to look at me, she was turning away. And this happened over a course of a few of our therapy sessions. And um, finally, we talked about it. And basically, you know, she was telling us that's not the way she wanted to communicate. Um, but we did end up with a system. We did more of a light text system where we use some individual um, picture symbols, photos. We also had a communication binder that we used with what we call partner assisted scanning, um, which is a really fancy term for basically what you are probably already doing, which is pointing to pictures, scanning, um, saying the choices. And then when you get some type of response or reaction, um, you take that as the response and, oh, I see, you know, you smiled when I said drink. So she ended up being extremely successful with that particular system. But um, boy, had we gone with one of those eye gaze devices right away, um, we would have been sorry. So always do some trials before you make a decision. Which also leads to the next one, which is communication should be multimodal. Um, we all know that we communicate in different ways. We use our phones, we use our computers, we use our tablets, um, we do FaceTime, uh, we do gestures, facial expressions. So just remember that all of that is communication and that um, we shouldn't just try to do one system. You know, 
maybe we'll get a communication device, but even if you have a communication device, there are going to be times when it's not most appropriate to use it. Um, it may be time consuming to set it up and get them in the right position. So you always wanna have some other backup methods to be able to communicate quick and um, get some really easy responses from them. So maybe a yes, no board with just yes and no, where you can ask some yes, no questions and get quick uh, quick replies. Um, also, there are times, you know, maybe at the beach isn't going to be a great time to use a communication device. So you might need some type of laminated board or something like that. So always remember to have different types of systems available. And then this one um, also is very important. It's never too early and it's never too late. And as Dr. Standridge said, we are seeing from zero to 100. So those little ones Let's get started. Let's figure something out. Um, it's not too early to get started with some AAC types of strategies. And also it's never too late. Um, I wanted to share a little story about a patient that we saw in clinic actually just last week. And I think she was in her 30s. And, um, you know, I came in, asked how communication was going. And, you know, basically they were um, getting by and doing really well with her nonverbal communication system that they kind of had already set up. Um, she had tried a device early on and was not um, interested or able to do that. So I pulled out my um, communication binder and started kind of doing my partner assisted scanning. And boy, every time I said something, um, she would give me very intense eye contact. And then I would say, oh, it seems like you'd like to talk about this. And um, I would get a big smile. So I think her um, parents were very excited to see how she responded to that. And um, I said, would you be interested in, you know, trying this type of com communication system with her? And they agreed. And she had a big smile and said, you know, basically she was interested in doing that too. So we're in the process of putting together a binder for her and I'll send it to their house and you know, kind of see how they do and then check in with them at the next clinic visit. So, you know, it may be 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever, but never too early and never too late to try. Which leads me to um, a couple of videos that I would like to show you. Um, I feel like this um, video is going to show you an example of it's never too early and never too late. And secondly, to always have that AAC available. Um, just a little background real quick before I start it. Um, this little one um, got her eye gaze device, I think right around two, two years old, maybe getting ready to turn three. Um, she is using eye gaze. In this first video, you won't actually see the eye gaze device, but um, hopefully you will be able to hear it. You might have to listen carefully. It's not, um, it's not real loud. Um, but also I asked this um, mom, I said, so what do you think it is that um, has made her so successful? And she says, we always have it available. It's with us all the time. And I would agree with her. I think, you know, she's amazing. And um, I'm gonna see if I can pull it up and get you guys to be able to see it. Okay. While you're pulling up the video, I'll just remind everyone that you're welcome to um, type in any questions into the chat. We'll take them at the end of the presentation. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to hear and see this. I want to stand up. You're standing. Go ahead. You're standing like a big girl. Can we do something different? <laughs> you asked to do this, though. Give it a little bit more time. How much longer will we be working on this? For a little bit longer. You haven't been in it long enough yet. You just got in it. How much longer will I have in therapy? I hear you for a little bit longer, okay? How much longer will I have in therapy? I hear you. I want to tell you something. Oh yeah? What is it? I'm scared to ask. I want that one. Oh. Puppy. You want to play with toys instead? Are you picking your toys now? You got out of the therapy page. Here's your dog.
I'm done. Oh, you're done. I think we can go a little bit longer. I'm hungry. Well, you're getting to be time, so you should be okay. I'm tired. Are you trying anything to get out of this? My activity. Yep. I Let's see. Watch. I see. Sing. You want to watch Sing? Well, we're not going to watch Sing. Finding Dory. We're not going to watch Finding Dory either. I want to watch Lee. Leah, I know you're just trying mm -hmm. any of your shows to see what'll work, but Move along. we're not going to watch those right now. Thanks. Leah, okay. we're not going to watch those right now. You're doing other things. No. Oh, is that how you feel? I'm sorry, that's how you feel? No. Is that, okay, well. I want something different. I bet you do, but. That we're not going to be able to do that right now. What are we doing today? Well, Susanna's going to. Tell gonna, me about your day. Well, someone's going to come over and hang day. out with you while mommy goes to work. I slept great. Oh, I'm so glad you slept good. I slept great. I'm so glad. Tell me about your day. Well, our day has barely started. It's early. How are you? I'm good. It's a little snowy outside, How though. How are you? I slept great. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay, I hope you guys can hear me again. Um, real quick, I just wanted uh, again to say, never too early, never too late. Isn't she amazing? Um, I big thank you to her um, parents for allowing us to show this video of her today because I just think she's absolutely incredible and can be an inspiration to others as well. Um, and then, here we go. So on that second video, I just wanted to point out um, how many things she was communicating. She was um, able to request what she wanted to do. She was asking questions. And I think um, where when she says, how was your day? I think she was actually maybe saying, what are we going to do today? So um, I think she was able to use different phrases on her device for different meanings. You obviously um, heard her protesting and saying no, which how amazing is that, that she was able to talk back. Um, she was making comments. She slept well. Um, so I think this was just amazing and has opened up a, a huge world for her in terms of being able to communicate what she's thinking, feeling, what she wants, what she doesn't want. So I have a couple more videos I'd like to show you. So I'm going to try to switch back over. And again, hopefully you can hear me. I apologize. This one is going to not be oriented correctly. It is going to be horizontal instead of vertical, but I think it's fairly short and I think you'll get the idea. All right. Can I videotape you? Okay. Here. Okay, Allie, here are three choices. What do you want to do today? Do you want to read a book? Watch TV. Oh, play trouble. You want to play trouble? Can you show me again? Show me one more time. Okay. Yeah, pick your color. What color do you want to be? You want to be green today? Okay. Okay, so that um, those second two videos, um, I just wanted to show you because um, that is the young lady I was talking about that um, we, I thought she had amazing eye gaze. I was for sure she was going to be able to um, use an eye gaze device. And really she did much better with her low tech, um, which you saw there, her mom was using um, three different symbols to find out what activity she wanted to do. And then objects, objects around, you can just hold them up and say, you know, which one do you wanna be? She absolutely loves to play trouble. So I know that's one of her favorites, so, all right. So moving on, um, the clinic here at uh, Cincinnati Children's, I just kind of wanted to go through what we provide in terms of communication. Um, we do ongoing assessments over multiple clinic visits. So each time um, you would come in on a clinic visit, we're going to do some assessment, find out, um, like I said, where 
where your child is, how they're doing, what would be the next steps moving forward. Uh, we make referrals for AAC evaluations, augmentative and alternative communication. So we are, like I said, we are lucky to have the Perlman Center as one of the departments here at our hospital. They are known for their assistive technology and they do AAC evaluations that include both a speech language pathologist and an occupational therapist. Um, they will see um, the child over a series of about four or five weeks and do some trials on different devices. And then um, based on the outcome of those trials, maybe um, practice some more. Maybe they've um, decided, yes, it's time for a uh, recommendation for a device and move forward with funding. Um, so we have that available to you. We also will answer any questions, concerns that you have, or maybe that you've brought from the outpatient um, speech language pathologist or a school speech language pathologist. Uh, we would provide recommendations for communication systems and possibly goals for intervention. So, you know, maybe we're going to focus on something specific for the next few months and then check in with you at the next clinic visit to see how that's going. Uh, we are also available to support and collaborate with um, the school or outpatient team. I've had a couple of conversations that have been absolutely amazing. Um, there was a school speech pathologist who um, asked if we could have a conversation because she had never worked with a child with Rett syndrome before, and she really wanted to find out more and really learn what she needed to be doing. And I was, um, I was amazed, and it was wonderful. So I um, encourage you to have the, them reach out um, if they would like to collaborate as well. Um, provide online resources for communication, um, and I have a couple of those resources in the next slide or two, uh, so you can look at those. And then also, um, for those families who come from further away, and Cincinnati is not going to be the best place to receive your ongoing therapy or services, I do try my best to try to find resources that are closer to your home. So evaluation centers that might be closer, or um, finding a speech language pathologist who is competent in AAC closer to the home. Um, and here's my secret for doing that. Um, so the vendors or the companies who have communication devices, and there are a few big ones, um, which again, I will show on the next slide or two. I um, will reach out to the vendor and find out for that person's location, what speech language pathologist are they working with in that area? Um, because those are the people that you're going to want to go to for therapy and trials. So um, most of the companies have a contact us on their website. And if you go to the contact us page, usually you can put in your zip code and then it will bring up the sales representative for that company in, in your area. Um, I would reach out by email or phone and just say, hey, can you tell me which you know, therapist or which therapy places in this area is doing a lot of AAC? And those would be the places that you might wanna check out for therapy or evaluations. And so a couple of resources for communication and learning. Um, if you haven't checked it out, please check out Rett University. It's amazing. It has incredible resources on the website. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, the Rett Syndrome Communication Guidelines, I have the link for you guys to link to that. Um, I would highly recommend that. And then um, ASHA, which is the American Speech and Hearing Association, also has a lot of information just on AAC in general, and you can find that information at the link there. So I know one of the questions that came in um, was regarding what is your favorite three devices? So I cheated a little bit and I put four. Um, here are the four main companies that um, we have worked with here in our area for getting the um, devices that use eye gaze. The first one is called Forbes AAC, and they are actually located in Mansfield, Ohio. It's an Ohio company. Um, they've been around for many years, and I've worked closely with them over the years. They have a new device, well, they have a device, and that they've newly adapted the device, and it's called the Winslate. And if you go to their website, you will be able to check out the information on that device. Um, Pranky Romic Company, or we call it PRC for short, just because it's easier to say, they have a device called the Accent 1400 that also uses eye gaze and is a very nice device. I really like that one as well. Um, 
you might have heard of Toby Dynavox. That's also a very popular one. Um, the Toby Dynavox company has an I-13 and an I-16 device out, and they both use eye gaze. The 13 and the 6 is the same device. The 13 and the 16 is the screen size, so a little smaller and one a little bit larger. And then a newer company to this area, but we started to work with them, and they have a lot of nice devices as well, is Talk to Me Technologies. So you guys have the websites there. Um, they have a lot of good information on their websites, some pictures pictures, some have some um, videos as well. And then as far as um, therapy services, evaluations, and equipment evaluations, I think that was also a question that might have come in. Um, again, I've already mentioned the Perlman Center. They are available for um, AAC evaluations and equipment evaluations. So if you have a need for, you know, a bath chair or wheelchair, stroller, um, adapted bed, any type of um, equipment like that, that would be a, a great place for you to go. Um, the OTPT department here at Cincinnati Children's will also see our kids for different um, services. And also where I am now, which is the Division of Speech Language Pathology, um, will also see patients for communication. And that's, that's it for the resources. I just wanted to end and say, um, this is one of my um, favorite things to share. And you all probably already realize this, but not being able to speak is not the same as not having anything to say. I think um, our loved ones have a ton to say, and we just have to figure out the right way for them to be able to communicate to that to us. So I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you today, this Saturday. It's a beautiful day. Hopefully you'll get out and enjoy some of it later this afternoon. Um, and feel free, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, share any more information that you may need. And I think I'm going to be passing it over to, or back over to Paige. Sure are. Thank you so much, Sherry. Oh my gosh. You're I welcome. could just watch these videos again and again and again. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. What you said, never too early, never too late, applies to a communication, but it also applies to therapies, physical therapy, occupational therapy, any medical issues. Mm -hmm. um, don't ever think that your child is too young or too old. Um, my favorite phrase for a growth mindset in Rett syndrome is, you know, my child can't do this yet. Mm -hmm. For anything that you encounter on this journey, if you put the word yet at the end of that phrase, it will help you go from that mindset of being depressed, sad, anxious, fearful of what they can't do to, you know what, we can work on this. And what I'm really thrilled about is that you're at Cincinnati Children's. Not every He's amazing. Not every <laughs> across the country has an AAC specialist who is so strong and so um, positive um, and equipped as you are to help Ohio kids move forward. So thank and, you. For and that. I would just like to, to say one thing is just Sherry has just been so impressive in, uh, ever mm -hmm. since she's joined our team. What she does prior to the families coming, just even, as she said, research who they're already seeing, what they're already doing, uh, what would be best for their child just because of location and resources. That's amazing, because that takes a lot of time. And um, that's how our whole team is. And that's just that's just a window into the care that we really try to give each one, every one of our kids. And thank you, Sherry, because it's amazing working with you. I appreciate what you bring to our family. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I enjoy it. It's my passion. And she's humble, which is even more <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and it's incredibly rewarding work. I know. I know. Um, our our, our kids, our loved ones with Rett syndrome, probably surprise you each and every day. And Absolutely. So thank you. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for sharing your information. Thank you for giving me your slides in advance. I did attach them as a handout. So anyone who's watching today that wants to um, access any of those wonderful resources and links that Sherry referenced, go ahead and download that, save it to your desktop, print it out, um, and, and that'll get you to those resources faster. Uh, but you'll also get a link to the recording and you can um, see everybody's phone numbers that Dr. Standridge shared. So we are coming up on the top of the hour. So I would like, if possible, to share some Rett syndrome resources. Um, let's see, I think my screen is paused. Are we now seeing my screen? Mm-hmm, yep. Okay, 
great. So I, I want to go through, most of you are very familiar with RettSyndrome.org. You know that I'm the Director of Family Empowerment with the Foundation. I am very personally connected to the work of the Foundation because I too have a child with Rett Syndrome. I too had never heard of Rett Syndrome until my first child was diagnosed with it, and now we have three. Um, so uh, we have a big family, a busy family, but my commitment, my passion, my life's work has become empowering families um, along their journey with Rett syndrome and accelerating research. So I wanna bring you up to speed with a few things that we've been working on over the summer and then let you hear from Jen Martin, who is also a parent and lives in the state of Ohio and is volunteered to be your state rep. And she's gonna share some great information um, about her family and what she's there to do to help you in your communities. Okay, so rettsyndrome.org, we have a multi-pronged mission, accelerating research full spectrum. We believe in investing in basic research, translational research, clinical research, and neurohabilitation research. Those are really concepts that I had never understood, was not familiar with prior to my journey with Rett syndrome, but I have become um, a deep reader of all things that are published and unpublished, and we work very closely um, with the entire field um, around the globe of experts who didn't uh, come to Rett syndrome the same way that I did, but are completely, can totally committed to our children. Our chief science officer, Dr. Dominique Pichard, is also a parent to a beautiful child with Rett syndrome. She was working at the NIH and was doing uh, rare disease research prior to having a child with Rett syndrome, and she has joined our team, and I couldn't be prouder of her leadership um, on the side of our house of accelerating research. Um, Dr. Stanridge, thank you for talking about the RET Research Ready program. We were, had that in development prior to the pandemic, and we worked on programming and rolling that out over the summer because the most common question that we were hearing from families was, oh my gosh, we went from no clinical trials prior to 2010 to our first clinical trial that was one compound at one site at Boston Children's to here we are in 2020 with multiple trials, multiple compounds available at many different sites. Then the pandemic struck and many of the trials had to close down or pause and are slowly reopening some sites given where they are um, in terms of state mandates and hospital mandates are at various stages of reopening. And the RET Research Ready program was really designed prior to all of these global events to help you find trials quickly for you to look at short videos and download um, materials that will answer your questions about what does that mean to engage in clinical trials. So I know it's a strange time where you're concerned about even going into a clinic for a flu shot or a regular checkup. Most of your visits have probably gone telehealth, telemed. It's been incredible to have the field of medicine um, advance that ability. I know for me, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, driving into the city for a checkup with Katie was a huge challenge. So having telemed come along has been a real uh, blessing to our family so that we don't have to travel as much, but we are traveling in for appointments that are essential. And many of the clinics have created a very safe environment for you to consider clinical trials. So please visit our website, take advantage of the RET Research Ready program and, um, and look up the My Trial Finder because as we are adjusting to our new normal, um, we want research to advance, and we are at a place in time where it can only happen through your family's participation. Through the My Trial Finder, you can find surveys that are um, just as important and fundamental to research as actually enrolling in a clinical trial. So whether there's a trial that you can participate in right now um, or not, there are always studies that benefit from your participation. So check it out. Now, on um, this past Tuesday, October 13th, Dr. Prashar gave a really wonderful webcast community-wide on the state of research, what RettSyndrome.org is investing in. Um, she gave an orientation around the trial finder and gave a status update on all of the clinical trials. So Dr. Standridge, I applaud you and your entire team at Cincinnati Children's for um, raising your hand and being a sponsor and an investigator for those that you listed in your slides. And if you visit the My Trial Finder, families will find that there are other studies that are 
happening around the country. Now, you can choose to enroll if you fit the enrollment criteria for those studies, and we can help get you travel support. Retland is a fantastic organization that helps fund some of the travel in case you have to go further than uh, getting into your car. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because Dr. Stanridge did a great overview and we do have a recording um, from Tuesday about the research side of our mission. On the other side of our um, mission is empowering families. And it's really important to us for you to know that you're not alone on the journey. Um, our foundation is comprised of parents and friends of those diagnosed with Rett syndrome who walk this journey together with you. We are committed to providing all families young, old, um, parents of males, parents of females, with the latest medical information um, while we aggressively fund research. We're here to offer meaningful support, whether it's just to be a listening ear to, um, or a shoulder to cry on, or to give a hug, or to give you that, remember to put that word yet at the end of your sentence when you're encountering a new problem with your child. We also do a lot of um, time and resources to raising awareness about Rett syndrome. Nobody cares more about Rett syndrome than we do. We are one of 7,000 rare diseases competing for attention um, in the world. And that is um, nothing compared to many of the larger disorders that are household names that almost everyone has a family member that is touched by. So while we do a lot of public awareness um, in the halls of Washington, uh, we appreciate you participating in October Awareness Month and using some of our campaign materials to raise awareness in your community, in your schools, and in your neighborhoods as well. It takes a it takes a village, really. So um, I don't want our newer families to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose today, that we're just um, putting out uh, shelves and shelves and shelves of resources and you don't know where to begin. But it is important for you to know that we have a plethora of materials available for you. We have the Rett Syndrome Handbook. We have a website that has hundreds of pages of material. We have a state resource page just for Ohio. We can take a look at that in a second. Um, we have um, a real person, a real person who's about to share her email address and her phone number with you in the state of Ohio who's, who's there to help you out. Um, I know we have families outside of Ohio. We're focusing on Ohio today because that is our town hall, but every state has a volunteer rep who's made themselves available to help you on your journey. We have materials to help you with IEPs. We have a clinic's referral list. We have social media accounts, which are tremendous forums for parent-to-parent -parent learning and parent-to-parent -parent support. Um, we have monthly newsletters, so make sure you're signed up with us to get those newsletters, to get all of the headline breaking news of what's happening in the field of Rett syndrome. We have our Rett Gazette, which we do print a newsletter and mail it a couple times a year because um, sometimes it's hard to get through all of the electronic noise and we love to just sit down and turn pages and see pictures of our kids and read about what's coming up, um, what's going on. Angel awareness cards. If you don't know about these, these are the best things to accelerate a conversation of educating others about Rett syndrome. So it's like a business card. You can order them through us. We have a template. We have nice, um, succinct, to the point information about what Rett syndrome is. And then you can add onto that card a picture of your own child and a little bit about your journey. Now, if you're at the grocery store or you're in a meeting or you're, um, going about your life and Rett syndrome comes up in conversation and you don't have a chance to go in depth, you can hand these cards out. And they're a great way to connect people to help them remember that you are living your journey and we need everyone in our community to help us. So uh, create some awareness cards for you and um, we're happy to get you that template. We also have the ability for you to create a personal page. So if you want to do fundraising, if you want to direct birthday gifts or um, holiday gifts, or just put out a general request to your friends and family to help support you on your journey, there's no better way than to share the personal story of your family. Upload pictures, um, talk about getting the diagnosis, talk about how it's changed your family's life, talk about how it's impacting um, siblings, your other children. and uh, people want to help. They're just waiting to for you to say how. Hopefully, you have people in your life who are helping you with um, with chores, with playdates, with whatever it is that you need um, 
to get through the day, but also there are people who want to donate and uh, donations matter. That's what accelerates our research and helps accomplish our mission to move forward. Okay, so what happened over the summer with COVID-19? Well, back in the spring, we all found ourselves suddenly under mandates to stay at home until we learned more about this virus and how to live with the virus in the community. And um, many of us were sent home, our schools were closed, our therapy units were closed, we were at home with our children without our usual equipment, without our usual supports. And what we did was we rapidly mobilized some of the um, world's global leading therapists in the field of Rett syndrome. And we had a, a we hosted a variety of Facebook lives where those therapists by webcam were connected into the actual homes of real families at that moment in time. And they gave some hands-on lessons of how to use your couch, of how to use a yoga ball, of how to use a wall to do things for stretches and moves and how to get into a pool and use a pool noodle to do something called aqua therapy, how to do communication with your child. And you know what? We should have done these sooner because they were incredible snapshots of the things that we can do to have rich, fun, family inclusive, um, therapeutic moments with our children in our home. So all of those videos and resources are still on our website and they're still relevant. So we hope you take a, a chance. I know nobody has free time, but those videos are really, really valuable to look at. So those are right now at rettsyndrome.org slash COVID-19 resources, and we'll be moving them over to our regular digital library you know, pretty soon here. We also post uh, community updates. So Dr. Tim Banke is our medical advisor, but he consults with all of the medical directors around the country who are experts in Rett syndrome, as well as experts in the field of infectious diseases to come up with some succinct wording about where we as a Rett syndrome community are at with dealing with the virus and giving some recommendations about returning to school, if that becomes an option for you, um, how to do it and other updates. So if you need to bring some um, uh, professional information to the table with you to advocate with your community for what your next steps are gonna be, please tune into our website and look for that messaging. Now, every month we do what's called Red Ed webcasts. I just said Dr. Pichard gave a great webcast this last Tuesday on the state of research and clinical trials and the RIT Research Ready program. We have over 30 webcasts recorded um, on every topic from epilepsy to communication to movement disorder, nutrition, GI, communication, as I said, as well as quality of life, self-care for yourself, um, issues of siblings, right? How does Rett syndrome affect them greatly? So tune in and we are committed that that is gonna remain our core education program through the fall and winter and into 2021 until we can all be together again at an in-person conference, which I know that day will come. Our next couple of Rett Eds are upcoming November 10th, one of the authors of the communication guidelines, which Sherry, thank you so much for your endorsement and contribution to the guidelines. It's not a very big book, but it is very, very rich, and it really is a transformative workbook that can help get you and your family along, um, whether you're beginning with communication or you've gotten stuck along the way and you're needing tips and ideas of how to move forward. So you'll hear from Teresa Bartolotta on November 10th, and then on December 8th, we're gonna have a session called What Do They See, Vision and RET. Now, if any of you have a child with CDKL5, you're very familiar with the term CVI, cortical visual impairment. It's a more common symptom with um, CDKL5 deficiency disorder. And we haven't talked a lot about that in RET syndrome. So Tristan Dinkle from University of um, Colorado Children's Hospital in Denver is going to bring some of the first learnings and research that is being done in the field of what do our kids see? What does sensory processing look like in Rett syndrome? And that is really important as we're talking about eye gaze systems and um, um, using picture symbol systems for communication. So please tune into that one. Um, and then in January, we're gonna have a part two to a webcast that we did a couple months ago called um, Where Does It Hurt? Pain and Rett Syndrome. As a parent, I know one of the most challenging, heartbreaking moments is if Katie feels 
uh, pain. I know that she's in pain. I know that it's, uh, but we don't know where, we don't know how um, to find out where it hurts. And we need as parents to understand this issue so that when we're meeting with Dr. Standridge or with our pediatrician or with our GP that we can quickly bridge um, uh, how to get to what's going on with our kids, especially if they're using communication devices. Usually when they're in pain and they're feeling out of sorts is not the best time for them to clearly communicate on a communication device. So we need tools and there's a great team that um, are, are gonna meet with us in January to talk about that situation. Okay, so um, more on our website, our primary care guidelines, pamphlets on scoliosis, nutrition. We want you to take advantage of all of these things. Again, don't be overwhelmed by them. You can reach out and we can help you uh, match up with the resource that you most need. Now, I'm gonna give a little pitch for fundraising because that is the engine that moves all things forward as, uh, as well as you participating in research. Many, many families are doing fundraising because Rett syndrome is incredibly important. And as I said, nobody cares about it more than we do. Unfortunately, this year, almost every in-person event had to move virtual. The Rhett Ride Across America is a great program that we're running in October, and it's a virtual ride that you can do anywhere. So if your child has an adapted bike, guess what? Sign up for the Rhett Ride um, program and go for a spin around the block. If you are a cyclist yourself, get a small team and do a socially distanced um, ride and uh, raise some funds. We really appreciate the support. Another uh, virtual event that we have coming up on October 24th is a Raise a Glass Against Rhett. It's a virtual gala. For $50, you'll get this beautifully etched uh, beer pint or wine glass. You can choose which one you'd like. I think we're probably too close to the 24th to be able to guarantee that you'd have it in time for the gala, but you certainly will get your glass. And that's gonna be a wonderful time where you can sit back with um, your family, small group, socially distanced, uh, in your living room or uh, in your backyard and hear some stories about Rett syndrome. We're gonna have some live music. It's gonna be a wonderful gala and we hope you'll participate. Okay, so um, my last messaging before I turn it over to Jen is a reminder that we are right in the midst of Rett syndrome, October Rett syndrome awareness month. And it's your opportunity to use your voice join in virtual fundraising, share 31 facts about Rett syndrome, pair them up with your personal story uh, associated with that fact. Um, we have lots and lots of lots of information on our website that you can borrow and uh, join in celebrating all that is there is to be hopeful and um, excited about with our children, but also to let people know that we still have a lot of work to do and we can only make progress in that work if we work together. So um, happy October Awareness Month and please join in. So now what I'd like to do is invite Jen to turn on her webcam and we're gonna do a quick test. Hi, Jen, how are you? Hi. Good, how are you? I'm wonderful, thank you. So Jen is mom to this beautiful, beautiful child named Sarah. She's gonna share a little bit about her family and tell us more about some resources in Ohio. We can see your webcam and your audio is great. Perfect, well good, well hi everybody. I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you and some of you I am meeting for the first time today. So hi, it's nice to meet you. I am in Ohio, I live in the suburbs right outside of Columbus um, with my family, my husband Paul and my son Evan and my daughter Sarah. Evan is 10 and Sarah is eight at this point. Um, we are, we are, I call us the, art, the Rett syndrome representative family for Ohio. Um, I say that because Paul is a dad to a little girl with Rett syndrome. So if there are dads out there who are looking for a connection point, Paul is happy to be that connection point for you. So please reach out through me and I can connect you to him as well. Um, we got our diagnosis in March of 2016 after years of testing and hitting a wall. Sarah was born premature. She was born about three months early and spent the first three months of her life in the NICU um, in Chicago. And she uh, persevered as she always does. And um, we quickly got her into therapies because as a preemie, everybody tells you they'll catch up. You just have to get them some help. So she was in PT, OT and speech long before we even got her diagnosis. Um, but it was one of those moments where somebody, the genetic counselor called me and said, I wouldn't wish this on anyone. And I remember in that moment that I decided that I would never let anybody else hear those words. And so I decided about 
three or four months after I came out of my fog that I would become the state rep for Ohio for Rett syndrome because I wanted to be a resource for families to call me and talk and I could be there to listen and try to provide as many resources as I could. So I'm really thankful to RettSyndrome.org for um, giving me the courage and the power to be able to hold this position because they actually are the ones that got us out of the fog and gave us a ton of information and, and just uh, you know made it made it a little easier to to walk this path. I will say too that um, one of the biggest resources that I have found and it, it's a blessing and a curse especially at this point in our uh, in our world and our lives is Facebook. Facebook actually opened up a whole community for me of people who have been through, um, you know, different experiences with Rett syndrome that I can tap into and ask questions of them. Um, I've really found a great community there, and we have both the the Rett syndrome family support forum, which is the more macro level organization on Facebook, but then there's also the Ohio specific page. I'm on both. Um, I'm also on Facebook. You'll see my email here is uh, it's weird. It's Jalisba, which is my maiden name, Jennifer Elizabeth Vaughn, but shortened. Um, but that's my actual username for Facebook, Instagram, um, and my email. And I also have a YouTube channel for videos of Sarah um, learning and doing various therapies, and that's the same name as well. So feel free to reach out and get in touch with me directly. Um, a couple of things I learned along the way with the Rett syndrome diagnosis is once you, and, and I think Paige put it really, really well, we went dark, like real dark, very, very quickly. We started focusing on all the things Sarah would never do and never get to experience and all the things we wouldn't get to experience as her parents for her. And, and it was crazy. We just had a moment of clarity. And I don't even remember when it happened because it was, you know, again, a fog moment. But flipping that switch to that growth mindset, as Paige said, was so important in our, in our lives and in our family and in our marriage to to get to a place where we thought, you know what, there's so many things she can do. And we started focusing on that. And we started surrounding ourselves with people who believed in our daughter and therapists who believed in her and caregivers who believed in her. And we made sure that we um, we gave her every opportunity we could. Because I think the one thing we, we discovered is that nothing is innate. Nothing is um, instinctual, I, I think, is what we found with our daughter. And that there are everything has to be learned she had to learn how to eat she had to learn how to walk um she had to learn how to you know navigate spatial you know spatial differences and navigate different terrain and she would stop in the the corner of a grassy knoll and a concrete and she wouldn't move past it because she couldn't comprehend the grass the the change in terrain so we just we've had to learn all of it and we've had to learn it alongside her but the reward of it is that she has exceeded expectations in so many ways. She does little things that we celebrate every day. Um, she tries to open doors now and she's independently walking over to the couch and sitting down, which she never did before. And now she's eight years old and doing that. And it's it's funny as we turn around, we're like shocked she's sitting. <laughs> we're like, what are you doing? And then she independently gets up and walks away. So these are all new things for us and for our family. So we just get really excited about that. One of the other things I would say that has been a game changer for us is we we bought her um, a, an overnight camera. So one, we bought it because we were concerned. We wanted to make sure that we could keep track of her sleeping habits because with Rett syndrome, as you know, they don't always sleep as well as as well as you would like. Um, but one of the things we noticed on her overnight camera is that she has a lot of abilities. She can sit up on her knees and pull a blanket fully over her head with both hands in full use. She can um, sit there and, and turn over and turn around and do all kinds of things in the middle of the night that she will flat out refuse to do in physical therapy. So I, I, I feel like if you have the ability to get a camera, it's such a window into what, <laughs> what they are doing when you're not around and what they're capable of doing, which I found very amusing. Um, and I shared it with our physical therapist. So everybody's so we're all on the same page now. Um, the other thing I would say, too, is. Um, her, she, I, I never threw Sarah a birthday party because I was scared to have typical kids over to play with her. And it was my own fear. And it was one of those moments where we, we sent her to school in first grade and these fifth grade girls kind of adopted her as their own. And they would skip recess and they would come to spend it with Sarah. And they threw her her first birthday party. And I, it was just the most amazing thing to see these kids that want to be around your kid. And so I would say give your kid those chances because I feel 
Like I need to do that going forward because I had my eyes opened by these other kids that showed me what my kid was looking for and, and how happy she was at that birthday party. So those are my those are my stories there. Um, so I'll touch on a few of these things here pretty quickly because I know we're running up against time, but I would say communication with teachers and caregivers um, is paramount. Um, educating them on what Rett syndrome is and teaching them how to communicate with your daughter or son is so important because a lot of people will tend to repeat. They'll tend to just pepper and they'll be like, Sarah, get up, Sarah, get up, Sarah, get up. Well, Sarah can hear you and she knows she needs to get up, but her brain is not communicating with her body in the right way, so she can't do it on cue. So, so educating caregivers about that and educating teachers about it, I think is super, super important. I tend to write a letter every year and send it to school um, that I want that I wanted to go home to the kids and their parents so that they know who Sarah is and what she's capable of and what she likes doing. Um, and especially now in, in the time of COVID, we, we try to communicate as much as we can with, with the other students about who she is and what she likes and all of that. I would say the peer interaction is super important. Um, Sarah had a really good experience at school for the first and second grade. Um, she had, there were kids who would sign up to read to her and the list was full and there was a waiting list for like two weeks. So the reading books with, with her friends and, and being in that environment and uh, just having the exposure to other kids was so helpful for her. Um, devices, so we use an accent, but we do not do eye gaze. We spent the first several years of Sarah's life really working through occupational therapy and isolating her pointer finger. And she used to walk around with it out, just holding it out for us. And we would always put her device out and she would go over and make choices, but her left pointer finger seems to be her driving force for communication. We've trialed eye gaze devices. So as Sherry said, trialing is super important and figuring out which device is important is, is the best for your kid. Um, the eye gaze was not the best for us. So we, we like the accent. Um, I think we even have the 1000, so it's a little outdated. But um, anyway, devices are great. It's super important to have that communication. But then we also do a lot of what Sherry said too with low tech. So we'll do touching and choices and I can hold up two shirts for Sarah and she can choose what she wants to wear that day or we'll hold up different food items, different books, things like that from an array of two or three and she can she can make choices and select what she wants for herself. A lot of the activities we try to do are really focused around occupational therapy because her hand use, um, for, from my perspective, is one of the biggest things I want to try to hold on to as much as I can. Um, so we do a lot of uh, self-feeding exercises, um, trying to work with um, a little a little spoon that has a, a wrist holder on it so she can start to, to, to feed herself uh, yogurt and different types of things like that. Um, we also have a medicine ball that we put her on her stomach and we roll her forward and she's got to use her hands to kind of crawl forward to touch an iPad. And that's something we've been focusing on quite a bit in OT as well. Um, so I think finding those activities that help with their hand use is, is incredibly important to, to get that or maintain it. And stretching is also important. I am not good at this. I need to get better at it. But stretching is something that we work on in PT. And Sarah has very um, tight muscles and she just fights us. And she likes that pro, I think it's called pro receptor feedback. So her, her wrists are like all of her joints are kind of turned and she likes having them in that, that way. So we work with her quite a bit to try to get her stretched back out um, and make sure that she's got a, as much range of motion as possible. We also use different um, uh, they're not devices, but different apparatuses that can kind of help her keep her hands a little bit more um, down because she does bring the midline right here. We have a bamboo brace that we got for her left arm, or I'm sorry, for her right arm. You put it on the non-dominant one. And we also got her a wrist brace for her left hand as well. So trying to figure out those things that can help her, um, again, maintain range of motion and, and not be self-injurious is super important. Um, we do horseback riding. Um, I've got that on here twice, sorry, it's important. We, she's been riding since she was two and a half years old. Um, horseback riding is one of the best things you can do for gait. It exercises the muscles for walking in a, in a way that no other activity really does. So we've been doing that for, for quite a long time. And, and honestly, if you can find a farm that will let you ride bareback, it's even better than riding in a saddle. So that's something that we, we, we've prioritized in Sarah's life. Um, for school, so we're in COVID, 
um, hot hot spot right now. Ohio is making records in a way that I am not super pleased with at this point. Um, so in-person school looks a little bit different these days. It is going, uh, I believe, city by city, county by county, school system by school system. So no matter where you are, I'm sure you're experiencing challenges with school. Um, we made the decision to pull Sarah out of school this year and do what we're calling our, our homeschool program. And it's being funded through the Autism Scholarship. We have a pediatrician who is a strong advocate for Sarah and has made it a priority to give Sarah the autism uh, diagnosis, which is just a word, but it opens up so many doors for insurance and the scholarship and other, other things. So I would encourage you to work with your pediatrician to figure out what the best path is for you two for school. Um, online didn't really work as well for us. She doesn't learn well when she's looking through the computer. She wants to know why her show isn't playing. Um, so that's, it's really up to you, but I'm happy to talk offline about school if you guys have questions. Um, our, our particular education program is rooted in ABA, which is Applied Behavioral Analysis, and it's really focused around repetitive actions, which is where Sarah has really developed a great foundation for learning um, through that ABA program. Um, so happy to share more on that privately if you guys have questions. Um, in terms of health providers, I would say we do see our primary care provider maybe one time a year, but I don't think of her as my main person. Um, we we really see our neurologist more, like well, hopefully not more, once or twice a year. But she's somebody that I, I count on for all of our referrals, for all of our um, prescriptions, for devices, for durable medical equipment, for... Um, home modifications, things along those lines. Our neurologist has really been our person. Um, and I know Dr. Sanders knows Emily De Los Reyes. She's our, our neurologist at this point. So we've been very um, blessed to have that group. And um, Medicaid, I'll jump into Medicaid really quick. Medicaid is a blessing. Um, I am super happy that we have the opportunity to have Medicaid in Ohio. Um, as soon as your daughter or son turns three years old, they become eligible for Medicaid and there are different waivers available um, that provide different levels of funding based on what you need. Um, they, it does go, unfortunately, county by county, like most other things. Um, but I, I have quite a bit of uh, experience navigating Medicaid and fighting with Medicaid and going through the approval process. Um, and I've worked with several families in different areas of Ohio. So if you have questions about Medicaid too, I can try to get you as much information as I can. Um, and my Union County, which is my, my county, my Union County rep is uh, very willing and able to talk with other um, reps as well. So please, please reach out if you have questions about Medicaid. Um, we have used them for home modifications in our home. We got Sarah a really nice changing table that has a remote control that goes up and down. Um, we are actively looking to get her a treadmill to increase her endurance with walking because she started to lose a lot of that with COVID um, and just not leaving the house as much as she used to and not going to school. So that's something we're going to go through Medicaid to try to get as well through the waiver. Um, well-being tips and tricks. Um, I, the, I put this on here. I should have just said constipation. Sorry, I didn't just call it out. Um, Miralax or other laxatives, I feel like are something that's really important um, to just have on your radar because girls and boys with Rett syndrome typically have constipation. So I would say keep your kids hydrated and also figure out what um, regimen is right for you, what works best for you. But keeping um, Sarah regular has been a very important focus for our family and we are constantly on top of it. So please, uh, please keep that in mind. So fun. So Sarah loves TV. She has very singular taste. She loves bubble guppies. And so we are, we motivate with bubble guppies. We own every episode. Thank God they decided to make more this year. So we're very into that. She's very into music as well. And she's into Taylor Swift and all of the top 40 songs. She went through a Cardi B phase. Um, she's very, very much into music. So I think music and TV are two of the things where we know that if she's having a bad day or if she's frustrated, we can go to those two things and she is instantly in a better mood and smiling and happy and wants to dance and just, you know, have, have a little bit of a, a different, it's, it's a way that we switch her emotions to be a little happier and, and be excited. Um, 
Books, I would say she loves to read books. She used to go and crawl over to the bookcase when she still could and, and pull the books off and turn the pages, which when she lost the ability to do that, I think that was the, one of the hardest things for us. But she still loves to read and she can still kind of turn the page if you help her and prompt her. Um, so books have been something that we've really carried through, um, you know, ever since she was born. And it's it's just such a great way for, for her to focus. Um, she particularly loves unicorn books. Um, and then I have horseback riding again, so I don't have to cover that again. But the other thing that we've done for um, that outside of, of typical therapies is aqua therapy. We did that um, twice, and that was actually really, really helpful too for her muscles and for um, just for a general range of mobility. So I would encourage you if you can find a place that does aqua therapy, it would, it's really helpful. So that's all I have. Please feel free to reach out. Let me know if you have questions. I'm I'm available. You can text me, call me, email me, etc. Um, and friend me on Facebook or Instagram or go follow us on YouTube. That's it. Oh my gosh, Jen, thank you so much. You are amazing and phenomenal. And Sarah is so lucky to have your family um, supporting her. And we are so lucky to have you as a support for, for other families. You shared some incredibly rich information. And I know that you genuinely really do put your personal email and phone number out there for our families to contact you to hear more. Thank you so very much for sharing all of that. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, um, everyone, you're hanging in there. So that tells me that your questions matter. And if I can, what I'm going to do is um, stop sharing my screen here. And I would invite Dr. Stanridge and Sherry. Um, I'm going to turn off my webcam because it slows down my computer resources. But Jen, also, if you'd like to have your webcam up as well, um, let's go to QA. We have five or six questions that have come into the queue. And we also have a full list of all of the questions that you submitted in advance at the time of registration that are on your mind. Hopefully a lot of those were already answered in the um, talks, but Dr. Standridge, I'm gonna let you go first and evaluate which ones were already covered and which ones you'd like to share some more information about. Okay, so Paige, is it best, uh, so if I bring uh, the questions up, do you see that now or, or not? I'm just trying to um, keep those so I can read them and answer them and, and answer them as fully as I can. Do you do you see my screen or if not you don't have to give um, yeah we just see your webcam so okay. um, you can okay. leave them on your screen so you can read them no worries okay. you're not revealing anyone's identity okay perfect thank you okay so what I'm going to do is just I'm just going to go down the the list of them and I think many of them I have answered but in case uh, we haven't I again happy to try to circle back and answer those that have come into the case since then so um, this regards a young girl who um, the family, I think, by my understanding of the question, has just received this new diagnosis. Um, the questions are, what should be our first steps after diagnosis? Our girl is five. She's still walking but not talking. How do we get into this clinic? What insurance do you take? What questions do we need to ask our doctors? So first and foremost, thank you for being with us today. And um, my heart goes out to you, as do all the other families who have been in your, in your shoes. And we all want to do what we can, not just the clinic, but as a community, to embrace you and uh, your child. And we are willing to wait because there's this amazing time of acceptance and of acknowledge and starting to uh, learn. And um, Paige and Jennifer can absolutely speak to that much better than I can. Um, from a clinical perspective, Sherry and I and the rest of our team are absolutely ready when you are willing and, and wanting to seek um, our care because we know there's, there's a time that you need to learn and accept. And so we acknowledge that. Um, how can you get into the clinic? Any you just pick up the phone. It should be that simple. Literally, we take all self-referred uh, patients and families, so it does not have to be a long, difficult process. And in fact, it should not be. Um, the time frame from when you get in can vary, and that's why we're adding more clinics to address this. So that time frame is less. We never want to be six months or longer. 
during uh, the first part of COVID, it was definitely six months. It was definitely longer. And uh, we have done everything we can to get that back under control because we want to meet the needs of your family. So that being said, it's generally around three to four months. Until that time, the last question was, what questions do we need to ask our providers? Perfect. And um, I'm glad that you want to ask those questions. I'm glad that you are acknowledging that that you should be asking those questions of those providers. Jen and Paige had talked about ways and questions that we should be um, considering. And uh, now it's online, it's available to you. There's a nice, wonderful guideline that you could say, hey, Dr. Smith, um, please reference this for um, you know what we need to do for my daughter. And um, it's current and it's great as far as the recommendations that a primary care doctor should be focusing on for your child. So please um, get that information that I provided earlier regarding what number to call, who to schedule, a, a sideline that when your primary care doctor puts in a referral, um, then that goes down the insurance pathway, the referral authorization pathway, those things are all taken care of and we learn what and who providers are can be seen and what time and all those constraints that you and I have a hard time understanding uh, because they change it and it's it's so difficult. So when your primary care doctor puts in the referral, then those things can be taken care of. Otherwise, we do it, it just takes a little bit longer, but we will make sure that we know who you can see, when you can see, how you can see, we will make sure it happens. Um, so looking forward to seeing you and your loved one in our clinic um, as soon as we can. Uh, benefits of CBD dosage recommendations. And so I want to acknowledge that we've been answering these questions actually for five years, seven years, 10 years. People have been coming to us for a long time with CBD questions as it's been always available uh, in the dispensaries and still is. Uh, while I acknowledge I can't prescribe dispensary CBD products, I'm asked about them all the time. Um, I always ask myself, is this safe for the person that we're talking about. If it's safe, then generally I feel like we can have a conversation with um, with the family about this potential non-medical intervention. Um, so that being said, while I can't prescribe doses and I can't recommend them, um, I do think they're overall safe. I think there's a lot of information out there. I think there's a lot of families, like Jen had referenced earlier, Facebook opportunities, things to look at what other people are doing, um, talking to the very non knowledgeable people at the companies that you would be considering. Um, so I can only suggest that, well, with safety in mind, I think that you can use a start low and go slow process with um, titrating those. Is there a study drug coming up for 20 year old rec girls? How are the current drug trials going? Drugs for use for anxiety. So those are fantastic questions and I think we've answered a few of them. Um, so we just finished our uh, 20 year and older study um, just a few weeks ago actually. We, we saw our last uh, subject in the last part of the study. Um, so the good news is, is yes, there are studies available, uh, just maybe not currently at this time, but certainly um, when future studies become available, um, we always look at all the, the uh, people that we've been caring for in clinic. We always look and see who is available based on age and uh, disease state, and we reach out to those uh, parents just to see if they're interested. And so um, knowing that there's interest if you would like to make that known to us and to our, our clinic staff, we will make sure to note that in, in our list of possible uh, patients for studies, and we are happy to reach out and contact you when they become available. Um, drugs used for anxiety. So there's a lot of choice that we have. Unfortunately, you don't have a specific um, treatment that stands head and shoulders above the rest, but the good news is, is we have lots of options if and when one doesn't work. Um, this is something that we're constantly studying regarding um, our drugs of therapy that we are looking at and studying right now. We're always looking for those that improve the neuropsychiatric disorders. And anxiety is the most um, commonly reported neuropsychiatric disorder in Rett syndrome from our parents. So we recognize this, we acknowledge it, and man, we have lots of ways to try to get to, to treating it. So to um, answer your question, are there drugs used? Yes. Which ones? Lots. 
And uh, as of right now, we would try one. If that doesn't work, we're moving on to the next one as necessary with you and your family. Um, and then the next question is, how often do you like to see the girls at clinic? So I tackled this a little bit earlier in my presentation, just that it's very, um, it's very individual specific, it's very family specific. It's also based on the needs of surveillance and how often we need to be looking into um, preventative therapies, which means imaging or EKGs and the, and the like. Um, so a lot of times we focus more frequent on the younger ones just because we're still getting to know what equipment they need and the, um, the support of, uh, you know, the supports that you need out in the community. Make sure that you have all that you need. What what are the needs? How are they changing? And a lot of times that is very um, intense in the younger um, ages or those with newer diagnoses. So um, often we will ask you to come visit us maybe a little bit more frequently then. But quickly we try to make sure that we turn it around to completely being what's available for you and your family. Um, what type of research are you currently funding? So that's a great question as well. And um, I think you can find out that information when it says we, um, we participate in therapies that are being funded in part by RSO or other um, foundations um, and through um, drug companies looking at their specific uh, treatment. So there are a lot that we are partaking in and a lot that we are bringing to you guys. But for sure, look into that new research tracker uh, that RSO has. It's a wonderful tool. Um, is there any new research to understand the meltdowns in those with atypical RET? And I would say, absolutely. It's not, I, I'm not aware of um, any particular study that is only looking at meltdowns, but that is absolutely part of what we're always interested in. So um, during RET research, we really look towards doing um, multiple surveys throughout the study to understand how compound X is affecting your son or daughter regarding multiple areas and neuropsychiatric um, disorders, anxiety, um, the meltdowns that you're talking about, those things are always part of our concern. And so we're always measuring if and how the um, compound of interest is affecting. So we are trying to study this with the many different compounds that we're, are in current uh, drug trials now because we believe that we want to treat the whole person and not just one entity, one specific feature. So um, neuropsychiatric part of the disease is something that is always front and center and always information we're interested in. So yes, we are studying that indirectly across all studies. Um, and then what behavioral therapies are um, available for Rett syndrome? So I love this question because I think, um, I myself included, it's taken a while for me to, to understand that, you know, it's not just medication, it is behavioral therapies that our, our girls and our families are out there learning and wanting to learn how we can um, make recommendations for therapies outside of medicine. Because I, I have heard it many times and expect to many times in the future. And I support the idea of, hey, can we do something other than medication? Or perhaps we need to do something with medication, right, together. And I, I truly feel, fully believe in that. And um, so we have a wonderful division of developmental and um, behavioral and pediatric. So we call it DDBP division. And they really focus on specific behavioral interventions. And we are happy to refer to those specific therapy um, uh, visits and, and clinics and, and teams to help you guys learn for uh, behavioral approaches outside of medication. Because I do, like you, believe that's possible. Um, a few more here. Let's see. <clears throat> How is coordinating the different needs such as therapies, specialized physicians, equipment, and technologies work at CCHMC? Great question and so important. And Sherry's shaking her head. I'm sure your head spins anytime that you come out of an appointment because you've seen multiple care providers that day. And although our goal is to bring things together, we don't have all the care providers because then every person would be in clinic for eight hours. And that's 
that's inundating and, and just not efficient with your time. So we recognize that we have just what I call the care providers just right there at this at the clinic, but we don't have a GI um, professional on our team. So we still do have coordination of care that needs to, to happen. And I will say that over the last several years, we have um, specifically uh, identified particular providers. So we have specific GI uh, referral providers. We have specific cardiology referral providers. We have specific orthopedics referral um, providers. So that way, communication is maintained. Um, if I need something, if I need to get to something quickly that um, happened in orthopedics, I will send a note out to our providers and get answers and um, vice versa. So the communication is there between providers, which is fantastic. And then um, if I need to make sure that um, PM&R is available, that I have this concern because of say um, Joni's uh, spasticity change or contracture change and I think she needs to be seen by PM&R much sooner than the four months away um, we work really really closely to help those things happen so hopefully it's not something that you're aware of because it's happening in the background um, Rett syndrome clinic is really I'm not certain how it is at other hospitals but our hospital uh, neurology is the hub so any question, any concern that you know that, that, well, let me back up, that you're uncertain who to call. So when you have a GI question, it probably makes better sense to reach out to the GI team. But for those all-encompassing care um, questions, therapy questions, um, you know, just general needs, general, I'm not really sure where to go with this kind of question, um, then please call us because really we, we think of ourselves as the hub. And our nurse really is awesome at kind of troubleshooting where and who that goes to. When she's not sure, then she sends it to us and we get involved. But as far as coordinating the care, um, we work really hard to identify those specific providers so we can have ongoing communication in getting you to those providers. And then um, if there's any concerns regarding the care for those each those um, uh, needs, we work with our, our therapists like Sherry. So if there's any speech needs, I'm gonna reach right out to her because she knows 100% more than I do. So let's get you to the right person. So start start with us at the hub at the neurology and we will get you guys to where you need to for those other um, care needs if you're uncertain at the beginning. Um, do you feel as though as a rare disease funding is an issue? Of course, but for certain, I can tell you who's on the case and who's making an improvements. So RSO, um, Rett Syndrome, uh, Research and Trust, that's awesome as well. We really are trying to do our fundraisers as well. And it just, you guys, we, we can't raise enough funds. So yes, it is challenging because we're a rare disease. But as Paige has uh, spent time with us earlier, we're not letting that, we're not holding it, we're not holding back because of it. Um, and there's lots of opportunities um, in your local area, at your, you know, in your RSO area, there's strollathons, there's bike um, across America. There's all sorts of different ways that I know people get creative about fundraising. And I can only thank you from the bottom of my heart because um, it does spur our research um, interests and it has done amazing things thus far. So thank you. Um, and then where do we stand with gene editing? So wonderful question. Um, it's an amazing time to be involved with Rett syndrome because the research has just exploded literally in the last decade and it has no signs of slowing down. And now we're really getting into gene therapy. And um, I am confident that before my lifetime, we are going to have a cure. I just know it. And I think it's going to be much earlier than I even forecast. So um, there are so many challenges and it would be silly for me to pretend there wasn't. Um, but we're knocking down those challenges just as we're talking about it today. And RET research will uh, the, re the RET Research Trust Fund, or excuse me, RSRT, thank you, um, is really, they're, they have a great um, explanation and I think like web uh, tutorial, um, webinar kind of thing available. So I would invite you to go there and look at um, the description about genes and therapies and editing as you're talking about. 
And I think that you'll find that that can answer a lot of your questions, maybe more in depth than we have time today. But it is a thing that is not necessarily in the distant future, right? I mean, like it, it's here before our eyes and we're looking at to bring that to you guys. Um, can chronic constipation be a cause of seizure? So that is a wonderful question. And I think that the, the person who has uh, uh, shared this question with us is all other people, even if they didn't say, yeah, is this true? Like we experienced that, can it happen? And I would say that the GI and the brain connection is very strong. There are millions of gut neurons that communicate well with the brain and vice versa. So yes, I believe that constipation can be a trigger. Um, and it is, that is part of the reason why we focus on a GI function for each one of our people. People, um, that we care for because I'd be amiss if we only thought about the brain and we didn't think about the GI and right now I'm touching the belly you can't see it but the GI gut uh, and brain connection is so strong so yes I think they're related and yes one can affect the other and yes there are things that we can do to intervene on that to help them both be functioning at their best um, and then I have a couple of uh, speech specific questions and I will turn that over to Sherry in just one moment um, I just wanted to make sure that I'm getting to all the questions. Um, there is one that I have to read out loud, and I and I hope that this this parent will be okay with me reading the name of their child um, because it is such a poignant question, and I just I, I want to share it with um, everybody who's on the call today because it's it <laughs> it makes me cry. Um, Addie has raised money by selling her paintings from an adaptive painting lessons, and she wants to support the Cincinnati Wright Clinic kids. Is there any need for a small donation? She likes to send things for kids to do, card games, coloring books, etc. And I would say thank you. Yes, there is a need. There's always a need. And we can do more with um, your support. And this is amazing. And so, yes, there is available. Um, there's always availability for donations. And I can only thank you from the bottom of my heart that you would consider us. And we will always bring the best care that we can to you and your family, regardless of donations. But we always appreciate them because they help us do it better. So thank you. And um, yes. There is a way to help that happen, and I know who you are. I have your information, and I will ask our administrative assistant to reach out to you so we can make that happen. But thank you in advance so much for that. I appreciate it. And thank you to all of you guys out there who are working to make um, donations a reality to whatever organization, whether it be us, whether it be RSO or others. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Paige to let us know the other questions and then Sherry to tackle the speech related questions here. Thank you. You know what, I, Dr. Sandridge, well, you, you need a minute to take a deep breath. So maybe we can let Sherry take a couple of the communication questions and then we'll come back to you. But I just want to say that that incredibly demonstrates the fact that our lives with Rett syndrome are not one directional. Our kids have so much to offer. Not only are those donations um, incredible and helpful, but the fact that, that this child has been enabled to advance so far in her life that she wants to give back and her family is in touch with the ways that she wants to give back are where we want to get to. Yeah. I agree, so, 100%. Thank you. thank you for reading that one. Okay, take a breath. Sherry, why don't you take <laughs> on some of these communication ones and then we'll come back to the medical ones that are in the queue. And I think you're still on mute, Sherry. <laughs> but it looks like you were saying some really important stuff there. <laughs> nope. You might have to unplug your headset. I think that's what we tried the other day, right? And then it worked. Mm-mm. Let's see, try again. No. 
That's so strange. Okay. Well, let's see, Dr. Standridge, can you uh, take a medical question? Well, yes, I can. Sure. There was a few things. Sometimes she just kind of sure. plugged and plugged and then came back in. Sure. Um, okay. So we have one question come into the queue from a parent who wants to know um, how they can tell the difference between dystonia versus a tardive dyskinesia. And not Ooh. everyone can know what those are. Um, so if you give a quick, you know, medical definition and then help a family try to figure this out. Sure. So um, I just want to say that it's challenging all around, even for those of us in the medical field. So you're not alone when you're saying, help us understand these big terms and help us understand the difference between the two. Um, so while we can each understand it from a scientific standpoint in the medical field, really understanding it from how your daughter's experiencing it can be challenging. So don't take, so take heart. So tardive dyskinesia is really our, these abnormal movements often in your face like this and kind of whiskering, if you will, eye blinking, mouth movements, um, often as a um, side effect from medications that hopefully will decrease over time um, once somebody's off the medicines. Um, they can't experience it without being a side effect, but that's most often when it becomes obvious to us. Um, and then dystonia is um, one of the best ways that I explain it, I think, is just um, uncomfortable muscular contractions that put somebody in kind of a weird position and out of control of their body that kind of gets stuck, if you will. Um, and it can be repetitive, so it can happen again and again. And eventually that starts just to occur longer and longer and longer to a point where they actually might be kind of locked in that weird position or or abnormal posture. Um, so those two can sometimes um, overlap and make it hard to tell that this is tardive dyskinesia and this is dystonia, where in reality is sometimes they, they kind of blur in the middle. Did that answer the question? Paige, because I, I don't see it, so I'm just, I want, I want to make sure, because I, I want to make sure I answered the question. Do you think that answered yeah. it? Yeah, if the parent had that question, um, needs some further expl explanation, please type in. If we do, you know, we're probably going to have to wrap up here in a few minutes yeah. because it yeah. is Saturday. And But I appreciate that everybody's here. And thank you so much because I I, I just, um, it, it makes us feel more like our community is, is there, right? And seeing everybody on webcam, um, just knowing that people were signing up for it. Thank you so much for your interest. And please share with those who you know haven't come seen us. Again, Sherry and I and the rest of our team really have interest on not only getting the word out because it's October and Re Awareness Month, but every month we really want to get the word out and we really our goal is to care for each and every one of um you know patients who are affected with Rett syndrome and their families across the us we would love to do it at cincinnati children's but we are humbled to realize we can't <laughs> so those of you who are out in california you have awesome opportunities out there too right but we all want to as a whole Rett consortium group i know i speak for others I know. And what I love most about our network is that you all are collaborative and supportive and not competitive about your patients. You just care to deliver the best care that you can. And we're so grateful for that. So Sherry, um, let's give you one more chance with your... Can you hear me? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. I am plugged and plugged back in. Not sure. So okay. real quick, um, yeah, we the are question great. about... So, um, I just want to plug in before people drop off that if you do need to leave and we don't get to your question, I will take them offline and get some QAs um, developed in a PDF and send them out to everyone who signed up today. Okay, so we understand if you have to get going, but as long as people are staying online and everyone, um, all of our speakers have time to stay with us, we'll keep answering your questions. Okay, sorry. Thanks, Sherry. Go ahead. No problem. Okay, so one question was um, f uh, difficulty finding SLPs locally um, who are familiar with the Toby or Rett syndrome. How can you find one um, similar to the ones we have here? So um, I would recommend calling or reaching out to your Toby rep and again asking that rep what 
um, therapy places or therapist in that area that rep is working with. And then that would typically be someplace you know you could go where a therapist would have experience with AAC or with the Toby device. Um, if you are having additional problems finding somebody, feel free to call. Um, you could call the rec clinic number and leave a message for me and I can try personally to try to track somebody down who would be closer um, to you. And then I think one other question I felt like I answered in the um, presentation, but the three, my three favorite devices, um, that's a tough one, but again, I do think a lot of the um, kids will use a Toby. And I also love the accent from PRC and either the Win Slate or the Pro Slate from Forbes are the top ones that we tend to recommend. Um, and I think it's just worth, like I said, trying out the device, um, the language system on the device and the hardware, it's, both of those things are um, gonna be something to look at. I don't, I don't think I saw any other communication questions, Paige, unless others came through. Uh, there are one or two in the queue, and let me read that, my glasses. Um, okay, so uh, we did have someone comment that the Rett Syndrome Communication Guidelines are fantastic, and another parent asked if you can suggest AAC training resources for parents setting up and working with their child. I think you addressed that a little bit. Um, if they're working online, should they go through Rett University? Do they go directly to the AAC manufacturer? Do they come in and see you at clinic first? Do mm -hmm. they All of the above. <laughs> Um, actually, yes, they could come into clinic and we could get started with some ideas and some strategies. Um, there is also another website I would recommend and it's um, Practical AAC, but it's spelled P-R capital A-A-C-T-I-C-A-L. And that um, has just an incredible amount of resources on it as well. Activities, how to um, do core vocabulary, um, focus on core vocabulary activities. I think each of the vendors also has um, really good activities and resources on their website. So be sure to check those out. So specific to your device, if you have one. And then if you don't have one, yes, make an appointment, come in, we can get started and give you some ideas to try at home. Oh, Paige, I can't hear you. Ah, now I'm muted. <laughs> wouldn't be it wouldn't be a webcast if someone didn't try to speak on, on well, mute. Well we are <laughs> we are getting good at reading facial characteristics, right? So <laughs> I was anxious, but I couldn't tell. <laughs> so we have one more medical question for you, Dr. Stanridge, and I think that's gonna wrap up our queue. Okay. Um, Okay, so it's a question about um, air swallowing. And if you know, um, is there anything therapeutically or um, prescription wise to help decrease air swallowing or help a child cope with a full belly? Sure. And so while I think there, um, this waxes and wanes over one's life, um, it tends to be more of a significant problem in our younger ages, at least in, in my experience that I've ex have had over the last decade. Um, it tends not to be such a significant issue with age, but that's not really acceptable of a parent of a seven-year-old when I'm telling you this, and I understand that. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel, as there is with so many of our um, symptoms that we are talking about and experiencing along with your family. So air swallowing is one of those. Now, typically also that does vary. It's really a, a symptom of concern in certain uh, number of patients and then not in others. So um, there is a variability of, of a spectrum of air swallowing. Tends to occur more often at, or most often around um, dinner times where we're trying to get our nutrition or we're drinking. Those times where your mouth is opening and you're swallowing because you're also swallowing air. Um, and so it tends to be around those times it becomes problematic. So very much like we handle reflux with sitting up after eating, 
with doing maybe smaller portions, maybe more throughout the day. Um, those are also options. Um, also encouraging to pass gas. And so we find that there are positions for our bodies and there's also positions for the bodies of our loved ones that may encourage that passing of gas even as ridiculous as it is, as putting them over your knee and patting their back like you did when they were a baby. And literally for some of our smaller um, individuals, we can do that. And sometimes that does help release that gas that they swallowed. So those things can happen and are helpful often just with positioning knees up to chest. Um, those things that we can try to do to help them get rid of that air in their belly. Um, if they have a G-tube, then venting um, is absolutely right at your fingertips and you can do it as many times as necessary during the day. Um, I will tell you that for those kiddos that we take care of that it is so significant that air swallowing, that there's concern about how it's affecting their nutrition. There's concern about how it's really, really um, getting in the way of their quality of life. And it's really a concern um, that just takes the entire, um, it just worries them constantly daily. Um, for those patients, we may actually consider is um, a tube necessary to alleviate that air that builds up into their bellies that they're no longer able to get rid of, that we are no longer to able to position them to help them um, dissipate that, that air that they've been swallowing. And so sometimes for the extreme, um, you know, air holders, air swallowers, um, we have to consider those to bring them relief, to bring them um, a better quality of life. And so we do consider all the mechanisms that I just talked about prior to that knowing that the continuum of air swallowing typically does decrease over time. So um, meeting the needs of your child, where they're at with the severity of that breath holding and that air swallowing is all a part of what we do with your, with your family. So um, no specific treatments that I'm aware of that can help with, particularly with air swallowing, but I would argue, like many of our other Rett syndrome features and behaviors and symptoms we're looking at during um, drug trials, um, these are one of those, it's one of those features that we're noticing may be improved, maybe with whatever drug study today or in the future. So hopefully we'll have better treatments available. Um, but as of right now, nothing specific. So we really try to mitigate with all the other um, ways that I just mentioned. So thank you for your question and we're working on that. Thank you so much. And um, I think that gets us through all of the questions that are in the queue. Of course, any one of these questions, we could spend one, two, three hours <laughs> on going on into in depth. And so this is not a one and done opportunity to get your questions answered. Um, anytime you'd like to reach out for your friends at the Cincinnati Clinic, I know that they're available to you. We are here. <laughs> Jen Martin is available to you. The rep for your state, if you're outside of Ohio, is available to you. I am available to you. Sam Brandt, who is our uh, family resource manager, is available to you. All of our experts are available to you. Um, again, I encourage everybody to go to our website, visit um, retsyndrome.org for families education and look at the 30 webcasts we have recorded on nutrition, GI, episodes, dystonia, sleep, all kinds of issues that were asked about today. You can get that in-depth look, but uh, Dr. Standridge, your, your answers were phenomenal. Sherry, your information on communication gives me so much hope um, just because our kids can't speak um, doesn't mean they don't have anything to say as evidenced by those amazing videos. So if those families are with us today, thank you for giving permission for Sherry to share uh, their incredible voice and the incredible ability we have now to let them express their feelings, develop relationships. Jen, thank you for sharing how Sarah has made friendships in her community. I cannot express how uh, touching that is for me that that your community has turned out for her and that you have facilitated that for her. And I encourage every family to make that effort because they can make friends and they should make friends. And um, Paige, can I say two more things? I'm sorry, they just came to mind. Um, yeah. 
I, I just I wanted to say uh, you know that we are one of the questions was when will we be open so hopefully we've communicated that we are open and we will continue to be open however that may look whether via strict telehealth via hybrid via full um, in person we are always available we're always open it's just how that looks may change over the next you know, coming months, but we are there and we are open and we are ready to, to be involved with you and your loved one's life. And then my second one is more of a story. Um, we have a, oh, I, th I think she's maybe in her mid twenties now. Um, and she has maybe five words that she shares with us when she feels like it, right? But one of her words, is a cuss word and I always laugh hysterically <laughs> because I'm always like come on cuss, let me hear it let me hear it let me hear it. I want to hear that cuss word and it's just hilarious I love it I love it I love it she lets me hear it and I just I think it's priceless I'm like I love the cuss words right so I just had to share that because um I loved it earlier when our patient was talking back to her mom loved it I was like yes that's exactly <laughs> it so so thank you, Sherry, for helping to make that possible. And we want to make it possible for other families too. I always say that if that's Sarah's first word, I'm going to just throw a party. I don't yeah, care. I right? just listen around her. She does listen to hardcore rap sometimes. I don't care. <laughs> I love it. That's so great. And, you know, it's important as our children age to allow them to progress their vocabulary on their devices uh -huh. as well so that they can use phrasing that is more appropriate for their age. And sometimes, at some age, we do tell our children, go ahead, you can swear. <laughs> so that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that story. Um, in closing thoughts here, does um, would anyone else like to, to say anything else um, in closing? Sherry, Jen? Just thanks for coming today. We really yeah. appreciate it. Reach out, please. You need a community. It's important to have one. Nobody is alone on this journey. So I hope that if you take anything away from today's session, that is the biggest takeaway. You are not alone. You have an entire community here to help you. Our children are worth our every effort to overcome the challenges before them and before us as their parents and caregivers and advocates. Um, please take the information that you learned today, apply it, share it with others, join us again online. At some point we will be together in person and um, we are together while apart, right? So mm -hmm. I don't know where things are gonna go with the second wave, um, but trust that none of us are taking our eyes off the ball of Rett syndrome, okay? We remain committed to you. I hope that helps you get through the day, get you through the hard times. There will be peaks and valleys and we will see you through all of them. Thanks for being with us today. You'll get a link to the recording tomorrow. And until we see each other again, be well, everyone. All right. Thanks, Paige. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.